Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. Welcome you to another in our series of discussions on the lectures on faith. Remarkable set of teachings prepared by Joseph Smith and the early brethren to prepare the School of the Elders for their ministry. And maybe more particularly to prepare us for better understanding the Lord, what it means to have faith in Him unto life and salvation, and, and to put us on the proper paths. We have with us today uh, members of the religious education faculty, current and past. Uh, opposite me is Professor Larry Dahl, Professor Emeritus of Church History and Doctrine, Professor Camille Franck from the Department of Ancient Scripture, Professor Jeffrey Marsh also from the Department of Ancient Scripture, Professor Robert J. Matthews, former Dean of Religious Education and now Professor Emeritus of Ancient Scripture. My name is Robert Millett from Ancient Scripture. We've come, sadly enough, happily enough, to a period where we need to c conclude, where we need to think back on what we've studied and what we've learned from this, this enterprise of studying and researching and thinking ponderously about the lectures on faith. I thought I might I thought I might just begin with a scriptural passage from the Book of Mormon. Um, as, as Mormon in Mormon, Moroni chapter 7 is talking about the ministry of angels and so on, he says, Have angels ceased to appear unto the children of men? This is verse 36. Or has he withheld the power of the Holy Ghost from them? Or will he, so long as time shall last, and so on? Then he says this in verse 37. Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for it is by faith that miracles are wrought, and it is by faith that angels appear and minister unto men. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, woe be unto the children of men, for it is because of unbelief, and all is vain. For no man can be saved, according to the words of Christ, save they shall have faith in his name. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, then has faith ceased also. And awful is the state of man, for they are as though there had been no redemption made. I think that puts faith where it needs to be, which is, if faith doesn't exist in the earth, we've got a real problem. What, why even have an atonement of Christ, which costs so much, if we don't have faith? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is what it's all about. It's this system of salvation. And so today, let's, let's take a few moments. Let's go around and, and talk about, in summary, what we've learned from the lectures on faith, and then share some personal feelings. Uh, let's begin with lecture one. Uh, Brother Matthews, how would you summarize the message and the importance of lecture number one in the lectures on faith? Well, lecture one, <coughs> deals with what faith is and it uh, indicates that it's a principle of power and it's um, uh, you know in everyone's life you become acquainted with the lectures on faith for the first time and I can remember the first time I read that and that was a new idea to me faith is a principle of power it shouldn't have been a new idea, but no one had ever said it that way that I had ever heard them say it that way. And so it introduced a new concept. And uh, we talk about the, by faith were the worlds uh, formed. Well, God created those worlds. And he does it by faith? Yes, because faith is a principle of power. And so there, 
In every lecture, beginning with the first one, there are new concepts or new ways of saying things that enlarge our understanding. And that, that's a, a, a main point that I've seen. Uh, there's quite a bit more in lecture one, but that's, that's the one that impresses me. Good summary. Me. Good summary. What's in lecture two? Lecture two yeah. focuses on how faith became, uh, how, how faith started in people's lives. What is it that caused people to begin to exercise faith in God? And lecture two points out that it wasn't just uh, studying, it wasn't reading, it wasn't contemplating these things, but faith came from two primary sources. First, that God revealed himself to mankind. That so the Adam principle and Eve, of revelation. Adam and Eve knew God personally, and after the fall, they continued to receive revelation from God. And secondly, human testimony, that Adam began to bear his testimony to his children, as, as Eve did as well, I'm sure. And that by human testimonies, it's someone sitting in a room saying, I know, that places a thought in our minds that inspires us to want to know for ourselves. When you consider, for example, as you start off as a Latter-day Saint, your faith is built upon, generally, upon the faith of someone else. And, and that's a gift of the Spirit in itself, to believe on the faith of another. But this travels back, it was my father, who had faith on the faith of his father, who had faith on the missionaries, and it eventually goes back to the fact that someone had complete faith that God the Father in Jesus Christ appeared to Joseph Smith in the sacred grove. And the difference in the beginning of humankind versus, you know, we may know someone of one generation. They point out in the second lecture on faith with a, a detailed chronological description of people's lives. Adam, who knew God personally, lived on the earth 930 years, nine full generations, if you will, of individuals heard Adam himself. It wasn't a second generation testimony, it was a primary source they got to listen to. That's clear down to Noah's father. Clear down to Noah's father. For the first thou millennia, there were eyewitnesses who heard someone on the earth say, I was in the garden. I spoke with God. I retained that knowledge after the fall. I knew him and I've received revelation since. It seems to really set a, a foundation that every generation after that cannot do anything but have I, that foundational I remember hearing Elder Holland, when he was president at Holland, speak to a group here at BYU and make this comment, we are only one generation removed from apostasy. All we have to do is not teach the gospel. Well, in the Book of Mormon, the rising generation did not believe in the tradition, the religious traditions of the fathers. Or, or they had not heard King Benjamin. Right. Therefore, they did not have that same understanding. Very good. So we have people on the earth who know God and have borne those testimonies, and revelation from him coupled with that human testimony inspires others to desire the same degree of faith. Very good. Camille, what do you get from lectures three and four? Let's lump them. Um, this is where a description about God's attributes and his character. Um, not his physical nature, but his his love, um, who he is in, in the, his very heart. Um, his constancy. The fact that he doesn't change at any time at all. Um, he's real and he he's immediate in our lives, but those characteristics do not change at all. Um, it's in those two chapters that I think he does be, the object of what we have built faith in becomes more pronounced. And because those characteristics don't change, we can have faith in in the sense of trust. We can count on him being just and especially, merciful. Especially right. when answers don't come immediately. In fact, rarely will we see the evidence immediately. There's something about the time and space, but we know that he is there in constant. You know, yeah. I have often uh, wondered about the statement in Alma 42, where it says that if God did not have the attribute of justice, he would, quote, cease to be God. I puzzled over that. Who would see to it? What does it mean he would cease to be God? And I've thought of that in, in two dimensions. Number one, he would cease to be God by definition, because by definition, God is a God of justice. But because of the lectures, he would also cease to be God to us because we could not trust or have faith in a God that was not a God of justice. 
And, that, and what these lectures also say, though, that could never happen because of his constancy. Right. <laughs> it's the same yesterday, yes. today, forever. So if, if, if we didn't have that fairly planted in our minds mm -hmm. that he was a God of justice and never changing, we would grow weary in our minds and we would have fear lest the God of us all would not do right. You think about this, it's why critical. do we study the scriptures over and over and over? Well, there are many reasons, but one of them is, is to teach us how God has dealt with people in the mm -hmm. past, how he has done so consistently and everlastingly, thus enabling us to have perfect confidence that he will deal in similar ways with us. And I, I think with that as well is then to start seeing that he's already done that in our right. life. It's section six of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 14. As often as thou hast inquired, thou hast received instruction by my spirit, or thou wouldst not have come to the place where thou art at this time. We suddenly start seeing that this has happened already in our life as well. And, and why, don't, why do we think it won't happen in the future? And when we talk about God dealing with us, we're not talking about a negative thing. We're talking about God gave eternal life to former people. God helped people in dire situations. God brought people out. He, he strengthened them. He succored them. He cleansed them. Mm -hmm. When we see the positive things he did, and we know that his character is consistent, then we know that he'll do the same for us. You know, our critics will often come after us and say, how can you believe what you believe about God when the scriptures clearly proclaim that God is everlastingly the same and that he changes not? But frankly, what, what changes not and what is everlastingly the same are the attributes. Mm -hmm. Nature. His, his nature his character, his attributes, his qualities, those are everlastingly the same, and thus he can be depended upon with complete confidence. Mm -hmm. Brother Dahl, what, uh, what great message or messages do we gain from Lecture 5? Unquestionably, we gain uh, an understanding that the Father and the Son, with the Holy Ghost as testifier of those two are the supreme governing powers in the heavens and that uh, God's power is Jesus's power the Holy Ghost testifies of those two and there's not a personage of spirit I mean not a personage of body but a personage of spirit and it just emphasizes God's power and plan for his children. And that lecture begins by saying we'll now deal with the perfections of God, meaning the perfections of his character and attributes. What else in Lecture 5? We talk about uh, eternal progression, and that's a very popular phrase. doesn't occur in the scriptures, but the concept does. But uh, there are some things in which God is fixed and perfect. We couldn't suppose that he would be more just tomorrow than he is today. Could he be more charitable? Could not be more charitable. Neither could he be more truthful. Neither could he be more loving. If God is going to be more loving next go around, I might wish that I'd come on the scene a little later. And uh, in, in order to have that unshaken faith that is taught in the lectures on faith, we have to have planted in our minds the idea that all of those characteristics and attributes are perfect in him. As well as the, the understanding of the plan for our salvation. Yeah. It's not like he's learning new truths that will help us in an even greater that way. That he's not learning new truths. That, or that yeah. there's going to be a better plan the next time around. Yeah. Uh, it's not like he's studying and saying, oh, I just learned something. Boy, I wish I would have known that before the earth had been I flooded. I could have saved have... more people yeah. if, if I had known <laughs> See, that. See, it can't happen. It can't happen. <laughs> yeah. the, the other question you ask is, what else does Lecture 5 teach? And that is that man can become like God. We do, so we don't have to wait, as we've indicated in the past, we don't have to wait for the King Follett sermon to get that taught. We learn in this lecture that through gaining the mind of Christ, meaning having the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. cultivated in our life, coming to think and feel as the Lord does, over time, our natures are transformed to such extent that we become joint heirs, co-inheritors with Christ, all that the Father has, and thus we inherit the fullness of the Father just as Christ inherited the fullness of the Father. Yeah. But see, that makes more sense when it follows after three and four, That's because correct. we see those perfect attributes and character. Christ becomes the standard, and suddenly when we say become like him, 
we see something far, far more that is possible than I think typically when we talk just ethereally. In, in section 93, it indicates that the Savior attained that status by going from grace yeah. to grace. And those graces are described in those chapters and the fact that we have the potential to obtain those graces. Yeah. Another point of emphasis in Lecture 5 is the perfect unity in the Godhead. Mm -hmm. That what one would say, the other would say, and et cetera, et cetera. That, that, and thinking of our eventual becoming as God. Uh, some people want to remain individuals to the point of uniqueness. Uh, at least in those critical attributes, we have to become one, just That's like correct. the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are one. Excellent. Lecture six. <laughs> well, lecture six to me is one of the more, while all of the lectures on faith are filled with marvelous doctrine, lecture six is too, but lecture six may be to me the most practical uh, as far as human life is concerned, because here we get down to the meat of the matter. The prophet had said that there, that there must be three things that exist before any rational and intelligent being can exercise faith unto life and salvation. They are what? One? That he exists. The idea that God actually exists. Two? Correct understanding of his attributes and nature and, nature. and character. Three? That our life is... In harmony you know, with his will. Yeah. An actual Acceptable. knowledge that the life, the course in life we're pursuing is pleasing to God. And, and so this lecture deals with how significant it is to know that we're on course, that we're going to make it. Uh, that, that to me is what hope in Christ is all about. If faith in Christ is to have complete confidence in Him, complete trust in Him, total reliance upon Him, then out of that flows a hope, a hopeful assurance, as Mormon says, that we will gain eternal life through him. There comes uh, an anticipation, an expectation, an assurance that we're going to make it in Christ. And, and that leads us to action, and action in that ways that we would never even think of, let alone do the without courage, that. The courage to accept a calling or a mission or the courage That's to do correct. God's will. And so it's in this lecture six that we, we learn about what it means to know that the course in life you're pursuing is according to the will of God, and the prophet drops on us this, this uh, marvelously sobering concept that that knowledge can only come through what means? Sacrifice. sacrifice. The willingness to sacrifice all things, even your own life, if called upon so to do. And it isn't that we'll have to sacrifice all things. You must be willing. You to. must be willing to do so. You know, there's a statement in um, Psalms, I think it's Psalm 50, Gather my saints together, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And uh, we, um, sacrifice is um, just a tremendously important principle. But I like to add along with it that concept of um, consecration. And to say again uh, that uh, when we participate in the higher ordinances and covenants of the gospel that are found in the uh, temple, that uh, we have that opportunity to make a promise, a covenant with the Lord uh, that covers this principle of the sacrifice of all things. And I think you said it right. The Lord may not require it of us, but he requires of us an attitude that we would do it if, if he we called, called upon us. This, this whole notion then of of, of searching our souls to such extent that we reach the point that one day we're honestly able to say to God, there is nothing you would ask of me that I would not give to you. Uh, or as Job would say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And interestingly, the seventh lecture picks it up at that point with the idea that when we're willing to do those kinds of things for God. There are blessings that immediately come. There's why an immediacy. You, why don't you go ahead and tell us, what about lecture seven? It's a, it's a rather lengthy lecture. It so. is, but it talks about the effects of faith, the power that comes into our life, the expectations, the miracles, the blessings, the spirituality that can be enhanced when we come to a point that we're willing to give the Lord all that we possess in, in forms of time and effort he in turn trusts us with the things he has to offer, which are incredible spiritual blessings. 
And these blessings, as you read in that opening scripture, are a sign that faith is on the earth and functioning. That when we are baptized, we have hands laid on our head and confirm members of the church and the Holy Ghost is not commanded to come to us. We're commanded to receive the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Receive ye the Spirit. And as we live worthily of that Spirit, it will come and enhance our lives and bless us in tremendous ways. So the fruits of faith are such things as spiritual gifts. It's to become uh, conformed to the image of Christ, uh, to use Paul's language, who is, what is he called in Lecture 7? The prototype of all saved beings. There's and also an emphasis, I think, on that idea of exertion, of, of the effort. The what it means to work mental, by faith. Uh -huh. What it means to work by that, faith. That doesn't just come... I mean, it is, it's a gift, but there's, there's a process that we are participating in. Well, you don't arrive at that station in a moment. That's right. It takes practice. Yes. That's mental exertion. And yes. it's not a physical exertion. It's not like blessings come because you tense up and, and... Or even necessarily because you work hard. <clears throat> exactly. Mm -hmm. It may be, in fact, that you're working so hard that you have never learned to surrender your will to his, and you're actually becoming counterproductive mm -hmm. in your efforts. Mm -hmm. Let me... Brother Matthews, let me turn to you because I heard you open your mouth and you wanted to say something. <laughs> well, about 15 years ago, I wrote my own little testimony of uh, how I felt about the lectures on faith. And my testimony has not changed, but I'd like to read it. Not very often do you quote yourself. <laughs> but It uh, must be good. Uh, You're quotable. <laughs> on, this, on this point, I'm going to read it to you. The lectures on faith are the greatest and most profound treatise on faith that we know of. Although the seven lectures are systematically arranged in a logical way, they're not easy reading, but they're worth the effort. The spiritual understanding that is available from the lectures on faith justifies many rereadings and invites the intense study for anyone who sincerely wants to know what faith really is. The lectures are a valuable clarification and bringing together of what the scriptures teach about faith in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. The orderly progress of ideas in the lectures on faith makes them one of our greatest possessions for explaining a systematic theology. And I will, I'll add this one other thought, and that is, in these 10 lectures that we have produced, we have quoted an immense amount of scripture, both ancient scripture and modern scripture. We've quoted living prophets. We've quoted prophets who are no longer living with us, but who are true prophets. And what the lectures on faith does for us is I don't think we've read any scripture today that we haven't read before. I don't think we've talked about any principle that we haven't talked about before. These things are scattered throughout all the standard works. But what the lectures on faith do is they bring it together and they focus on this point or that point. And having these lectures available to us in that concentrated form is just, to me, a very great privilege. Why don't we each take, why don't we each take about, uh, so Bob, Bob started us, uh, Jeff, why don't you take a half a minute or so, sure. or 45 seconds, and share your feelings. And uh, I mean, looking at all seven, looking at your own experience, what do the lectures on faith mean to you? You know, the early brethren treated theology, the study of God, and how can we become like him, as a science. And they tried in several publications to lay out in a very orderly way, as you mentioned, the theology that had been revealed to and through the prophet Joseph Smith. That there really is a way for normal, average, garden variety people to come to know God in a, in a profound way. In the version of the Lectures on Faith I have, there was included a, an additional lecture by Orson Pratt called True Faith. And he tried to sum up these uh, just briefly. He said, to have faith is simply to believe. Faith or belief is the result of evidence presented to the mind. Salvation is the result of faith. Salvation depends on our loving God, and that loving God is the keeping of His commandments, and the keeping of His commandments is the only sure evidence of our really believing that Jesus is the Christ. The first effect of true faith 
is sincere, true, and thorough repentance of all our sins. The second effect is an immersion in water for the remission of sins. The third is reception of the ordinance of the laying on of hands for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the first principles of the gospel. True faith will always lead us to true principles and ordinances, which in turn, coupled with the Holy Ghost, will guide us back to the presence of our Heavenly Father. Excellent. Camille? I think one of the first times I started to appreciate lectures on faith was after I had read it a few times and thought I, this is easy, what's, so, what's new about this? I was pretty um, naive about things. But when I first started to get a sample of it, um, I think the, the mm, most powerful um, idea came to me was John 17, 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. But I started thinking, there is something more in that. I think um, I started to feel an, a, a proximity to God and have a greater reverence for Him that I had never sensed before. That He was greater, uh, more wonderful than I'd ever imagined, but at the same time, very personal. And I felt closer to Him than I'd ever felt before. And the lectures on faith help you get there? Oh, I, it was this, it, it was. And every time I've gone back through it since, um, only increases that. Larry? I was confronted as I read the lectures on faith several times to come up with a definition of faith not using Paul's words or Alma's words and I found uh, Elder Talmage and the Prophet Joseph helpful that uh, faith is having enough confidence and trust that we act, that we obey and that our actions expose our faith. Whatever we have faith in is demonstrated by our actions. How I feel about the lectures, I love the lectures on faith. For me, they carry a special spirit. They are rich, a rich source of doctrinal treasures couched in clear and powerful language. One can drink as deeply from them as he has a mind to. I commend them to you. Well, I have with you a witness of the truthfulness of many of the principles we've talked about. Every time I read them, I not only grow in understanding of faith, but I grow in deeper appreciation for the work of the man who orchestrated their coming together and being placed in the Doctrine and Covenants. I see the handprints of Joseph Smith upon the lectures on faith. They bring me closer to him and thus in the process, closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. For more information on the Lectures on Faith, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.